And we're back, like we never left. This is episode 228 of the Confessions of a Not-So-Dangerous Mind podcast. I'd like to thank you all for spending some of your Friday evening with me here in New York. Once again, we're going to skip past all of that promotional jazz and get right to the guts of the episode. So you know the phrase, day late and a dollar short. Well, yesterday was the 27th anniversary of the release date of easily a top five greatest action thriller ever made, John Woo's Face Off. The movie is so good that I'm going to pretend that it's yesterday and it's the 27th anniversary as opposed to a belated 27th anniversary tribute to Face Off. Now, Face Off is a movie that I saw on its opening day and I read the screenplay. But the interesting thing, among many, when it comes to Hollywood, when it comes to big studio productions, the screenplay that sold to the studio may only bear a passing resemblance to the finished product. And I read the selling draft of Face Off, written by Mike Werb and Michael Caleri, and I think it sold in 1995. I'm not sure about that date of when it sold. But if you've seen the movie and you read the script that sold, you would be somewhat surprised to find that maybe 25% is all that's left. There were numerous angles that were invented for the movie. The script that sold, which the studio clearly loved, they continued to work on and work on and work on and work. The whole angle with the kid, no, did, didn't happen, wasn't in there. Most of the major plot mechanics did not exist in the original script. The idea of the swapping of consciousnesses and all of that, changing identities, yes. But the story was, it really, I didn't think the script was that great. The movie was way better. And if you go on Rotten Tomatoes right now, Face Off sits at 93%. That is what we call rarefied air for an action movie, for a popcorn action film whose primary, secondary, tertiary purpose is to entertain. They're not solving the world's problems with this movie, and they're not even making larger points about humanity a la James Cameron in Terminator 2, where that's an action thriller, but that is an action thriller that asks a lot of questions that don't really have answers. Face Off is postmodern sci-fi and also an action thriller. It's kind of an unusual combination, but the actors are so sincere that they make it work. The cast is brilliant, up and down the line. And Wu's direction, that John Wu had been famous or infamous, depending on who you ask, for his use of slow motion, operatic, almost ballet style violence. And it is put to very serious use in this film. And Nicolas Cage, I, I feel like Nicolas Cage has to be considered the star. I think he gets slightly more screen time than Travolta. I would argue that he has the more difficult role than Travolta, but that's neither here nor there. So Cage had won the Oscar for leaving Las Vegas. Probably not more than a couple of months before he began work on Face Off. I think he shot Face Off before Con Air. I'm not sure about that. They both came out the same summer. But Cage, despite winning the Oscar for leaving Las Vegas had a reputation, as he still does, that there are certain roles and movies where he just basically goes bonkers. And if he only had played Caster Troy, the nefarious, world's terrorist number one, Caster Troy, if he had only played Caster Troy, this would probably be seen as, like the guy just won an Oscar for giving an incredibly human, deep, brutal, performance as an alcoholic who doesn't want to get better. He just wants to be allowed to drink himself to death in peace. Caster Troy is a psychopath, a sociopath, 
He would be a serial killer if he could. He would be a drug lord if he could. He would be a world's worst person number one if he could and probably already is. And he is, it's a high wire Nicolas Cage performance as Caster Troy. And it would be a step down into realms of the absurd for an Oscar winner were it not for the fact that because of the contortions of the plot, which has John Travolta's uh, a government guy, government agent, Sean Archer, through an insane series of things that would never happen in a normally occurring world, he has to undergo this crazy radical reconstruction and he will emerge as Castor Troy, a.k.a. Nicolas Cage. Nicolas Cage wakes up with John Travolta's memories. He just looks and sounds like Nicolas Cage. So the high wire act, the insanity, the Castor Troy, all of a sudden you have the mind of a grieving father who feels that he didn't do enough to protect his son, who feels that he should be dead instead of his son. And Nicolas Cage, in the moments where his character is not pretending to be the real caster Troy, but is thinking and moving and feeling like Sean Archer, Cage is magnificent. And Travolta is fucking hilarious when he is Caster Troy, who looks like John Travolta. Whee! What a predicament! Man, you good looking. Papa's got a brand new bag. You always know who to root for. What could be a confusing layout is not. The actors are one thing. But we never lose sight of who's who at what point. Yeah, this is Caster Troy. It looks like Caster Troy, but it's really Sean Archer and vice versa. And the supporting performers, in particular, Dominique Swain as Sean Archer's daughter. The relationship between Caster Troy in Sean Archer's body and Dominique Swain as the daughter it doesn't, it doesn't do anything like what you're expecting. And I remember seeing the movie the first time. I'm like, oh, my God. Like, I thought I knew where it was going. And the joke at the time was the same year, Dominique Swain played Lolita, the remake, the Adrian Line remake or reboot or whatever you want to call it, of Kubrick's classic Lolita. So with that on the brain, you think that Travolta is going to do something that he doesn't end up doing, even though he now has the brain, the mind, the memories of the sociopathic, psychotic, murderous Castor Troy. Joan Allen, for about the fourth or maybe fifth time already in her career, as Eve Archer, a doctor, the wife of Travolta, Sean Archer, and then, uh, you know, 40 minutes into the movie, she's the wife of, well, Sean Archer in body, but it's not really her husband. It's Caster Troy's, but it, it's so fucked up. But what could have been another thankless role is rescued by the amazing Joan Allen. In Searching for Bobby Fischer, she takes what could be a role, a throwaway role of the mom of the main character of Josh Waitzkin and makes it memorable. She's the most distinctive character in that film. Surrounded by heavy hitters, Oscar nominees, Lawrence Fishburne, Oscar winner, Sir Ben Kingsley. Joan Allen just basically walks away with the film. Opposite Anthony Hopkins in Nixon, what? She's fucking great as Pat Nixon. The Ice Storm, she registers stronger than the other big names, whether it's Sigourney, whether it's Kevin Klein. In Face Off, this character is written, it's not really a character. It's a, it's a stereotype. It's, it's just bullshit. It's a doctor, and she... 
She somehow makes it memorable. She somehow sells it. This is a real person. This is not a plot device. Because you start working out the math here, and okay, as far as Tuesday of a certain week, when she was having sex with her husband, it was not only Sean Archer in body, but it was the husband with whom she raised the child, and they lost the child, and they're still grieving. And at a certain point in time, she's having sex with a guy whose behavior is a little bit different than her husband. Well, my husband's been going through a lot. Or as she says to Nicolas Cage, as Sean Archer, so to speak, when she realizes what's happened, remember that undercover thing that I was doing, honey? Here I am. Here I am, the one that you love, asking for another date. And she has an absolutely sensational line reading because you know she's got to say something. Because in her mind, she cheated on Sean, even though it looked like Sean. There was something off about him, but woman's got to, you know, got needs too. Guys had a tough week. They have a little SEX. But what she says when she explains to Nicolas Cage, we've been living as husband and wife. A very diplomatic way of saying, I've been having sex with this guy because he looks like my husband. Oops. Sorry. It could be a throwaway role, but because of Joan Allen's talent, her ability to register, her ability to hold her own against big hitters, whether it's Travolta or whether it's Nicolas Cage. She just shrugs her shoulders and she takes control of every scene she's in. This is not a shrinking violet of a spouse. And I'll never forget, and the movie was not that great before and after. Yet Edward Furlong, I think it was Edward Furlong, and yet Liam Neeson and Meryl Streep. Meryl Streep in that movie plays a doctor. Okay? She's a brilliant doctor in that movie. And when she's on screen with Liam Neeson, her character just keeps shrinking. It's almost like they told Meryl to go small. Don't do anything. Let Liam run the show. Well, I don't know what they told Joan Allen in Face Off, but whether she was following direction or whether she just says, I'm going to have some fun because I normally would make a movie like this. I'm supposed to be Miss Serious, and here I am in a popcorn, blow shit up real good actioner. A testosterone-fueled action film. And she fucking nails it. She's great. The nominal plot of Face Off, for those of you who haven't seen it, and by the way, let me point out, it's on AMC Plus right now. It's yet another one of those big movies from the 90s that's bounced around from one streamer to it's on Netflix, it's free with Prime, then it's on Max, then it was Paramount Plus. Right now it's on AMC Plus. But the nominal plot, to kind of go back to the beginning, John Travolta plays Sean Archer. I'm not sure if he's FBI, CIA. He's some kind of an alphabet soup, but he's very high up in the alphabet soup chain of command. He's a field agent, but he's not just a field agent. This is, this is a big hit. It's a serious guy. And terrorist number one, Caster Troy, played by Nicolas Cage, has apparently planted some kind of a nuclear detonation somewhere, and then Castor Troy is injured to the point where he's in a coma, and there might be millions of deaths, unless we can somehow find out from Castor Troy's brother, Pollux, where the bomb is, and what can we do? And that's where they hatch this crazy postmodern sci-fi twist of, we are going to take your face off and then his face off and John Travolta looking like Nicolas Cage gets dropped into a supermax's supermax prison and a lot of shit goes wrong because it wouldn't be a movie if the best laid plans here and then 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 here, and then here didn't continually go astray. Great idea. Oops, fuck that up. Fuck that up. Fuck that up. This got screwed. Holy shit, we're all going to die. Or as I've already said, in the immortal words of John Travolta, what a predicament. 
Face Off was an enormous box office hit. So this is one of those action films. It doesn't happen that often. It happened with Terminator 2, as I said. It happened with Die Hard. But Die Hard, the original, was not as big a hit as it should have been. The later Die Hard films, dollar for dollar, especially Die Hard 2, were bigger hits. But Face Off, the critics were rapturous in praise. And I remember I was in shock. I couldn't believe the reviews the film was getting. There were people saying, this is as good as Terminator 2. Four stars. Best action movie ever made. Better than Terminator 2. So it got incredible critical reviews, and it crushed the box office. 250 plus million. 27 years ago. That's a lot of money. I saw it opening night, and I was... I was still blown away. I was quite confident the movie was going to be great. But it was even better than advertised. And that's something which doesn't happen that often. It's something that I would say happened with Terminator 2. Because Terminator 2 had been buzzed about for a year. People were talking about it. And with the pedigree of James Cameron, you knew it was going to be quality. A random filmmaker cannot make aliens or the abyss, for that matter. I I knew the Terminator 2 was going to be, at worst, it was going to be as good as the first one. It was a bonus that it ended up being a four-star, all-time masterpiece. Face Off looked like it was going to be fun, but the story was deeper. They went deeper than that original script, which sold just based on the fact that the concept was really cool. The twist with the sun the caster and the Gina Gershon character, that wouldn't have looked good on the page. It's the kind of thing that if I had seen it in a script, I would have said, oh my God, this is dumb. Give me a break. But the actors sell it. And the two halves of Sean Archer, when Nicolas Cage, his scenes with Gina Gershon, where the two of them were together, even though the guy's fucking nutcase, But now, Cage, with Archer's brain, is not assessing this the same. And humanity inherent there is something that I latched onto and that I got it. Even though I was 23, I was angry, I was lonely, I was in cell, in cell theater. But there was something in that that I appreciated. That as much as Sean Archer hated Caster Troy and didn't just want to capture him, he would have been okay putting about a thousand bullets in him because he killed his son. He was aiming for him, and he killed his son instead. The humanity that comes through when he realizes there is a child that had nothing to do with Caster Troy and Sean Archer. This, this kid has nothing to do with me, and he deserves as much of a chance at a life. He doesn't deserve to get his brain splattered across this apartment. And it works. And I feel like on the page, I would have just said, bullshit. No way. And it's really one of the best twists in the movie. You don't expect there to be any kind of a heartwarming angle or something that would even make you choke up a little bit. Yeah, but seeing the fact that he was supposed to die and his son took the, took the hit, took the bullet, that's terrible. It's a way the film builds to a climax that is more emotional than you think. And the movie earns it because the character, the kid, it's not a token. It's not just thrown in there to get some cheap emotion. And Gina Gershon, very interesting character. I always liked her as an actress, but a very interesting character. She's done bad things, yes. Don't bring this on the kid. And when Nicolas Cage, who she still thinks is really the the real caster Troy, he makes a promise. Sean Archer's brain makes a promise. And he holds to it. He does not let his rage sway him. He knows it's the right thing to do. She's right, even though this is a person that under different circumstances, Sean Archer would be putting 15 bullets in her too. 
but she's right. This child has nothing to do with any of this. It works. Now, the actual action sequences in the film, the balance and the way that John Woo, and this is something that only really great filmmakers have, it's a kind of radar sense. If you're going to use slow motion, if you're going to use wire work, if you're going to use green screen, well, how do you balance it? How do you know what to do? Don't look at me. But the action sequences are so beautifully choreographed. It doesn't take away from the brutality. It doesn't take away from the, quite frankly, horrendous pain that the characters are feeling as their bodies are being riddled with bullets. But there is a beauty to it. There is a magic to it. And I think there are four large-scale action sequences in this film. And they're all great. They're all great. The stunt work, there's like a motorboat chase. The stunt work is top-notch. And there is... Travolta was able to have... What Travolta is able to do when he's Caster Troy, the joy that he feels, because he's a sociopath. He knows that what he's doing is wrong. He doesn't give a shit. Travolta seems to be having the time of his life. Now, he had, the year that Nicolas Cage won Oscar for Leaving Las Vegas, if you ask me, and I saw all the big performances that year from Anthony Hopkins, Richard Dreyfuss, and Mr. Holland's Opus, and um, Leaving Las Vegas, Nicolas Cage. John Travolta gave the best performance of 1995 in Get Shorty as Chili Palmer. That's a hill I'll go down on. It is the single best piece of film acting in John Travolta's entire career. Better than Saturday Night Fever and sure as hell better than Pulp Fiction, where he's a supporting character. I never got why he was up for lead actor in that. I love the guy. And I love the character of Vincent Vega. But it's a supporting part. Of course, that didn't prevent Jeffrey Rush from winning the Best Actor Oscar for Shine. He had even less screen time than Travolta. That's neither here nor there. But Travolta had made some heavy movies. He did White Man's Burden in 94. He did the movie, um, the one where he plays the guy, Phenomenon. That was kind of a, a tearjerker. He's having fun in Face Off. He appears to be enjoying himself. And he was in his early 40s at the time. And the comeback with Pulp Fiction and the just brilliance of Get Shorty through and through. Travolta was riding high, and he was having a fucking blast. And it comes through in the performance. And he doesn't do what you think he's going to do when he's the bad Sean Archer, because it's Caster Troy underneath. He doesn't do what you expect. And as preposterous as the entire film is, I just love the performances. No one is coming across as if they're winking at the audience that, yeah, this is trash, but it's going to be really good anyway. It's this entertaining trash. They're treating it as if they're in Shakespeare. Works for me. Now, I've probably seen Face Off 10 times, start to finish. I didn't see it twice in theaters. 97 for me, big movie summer. I love Breakdown with Kurt Russell, which was earlier in the summer. Austin Powers, International Man of Mystery. Fucking love it. Uh, Mimic. A horror film directed by uh, very young at the time, uh, Guillermo del Toro. Very, very solid movie. Uh, didn't see Speed 2 Cruise Control. Not so good. Face Off, though, is a film that still plays. There are certain movies, even action films, that some of the concepts are a little bit dated and you say, well, it doesn't really work now. You know, the, the time for this has passed. But the irony with Face Off, because the film only exists because of a postmodern science fiction twist, it's timeless. And I don't know that they were necessarily going for that, that, oh, if we do something that doesn't exist yet, it'll be time. Well, they succeeded. A movie I've discussed on the channel a couple of times, John Frankenheimer's 1966 mega classic Still somewhat underseen, but not underappreciated. It's in the National uh, the Library of Congress, the film registry. Seconds, 
deals with something similar. It deals with postmodern science fiction. Now, in the world of that film, it's very similar to what they do in Face Off, although it's more standard radical reconstructive surgery. They literally transform an actor who looks like, well, uh, the actor John Randolph, let's put it that way, they transform a man who looks like an actor of 50 who is a normal-looking man, and we're going to turn him into 40-year-old Rock Hudson using nothing but surgical uh, scalpel and other tools. It's very similar. That film is timeless. 60 years on, we're not even in the ballpark of trying to do that kind of surgery. It can't exist. It's fiction. It's science fiction. And face off, for all the shit blowing up, it leaves you with a lot of scientific questions and I wonder what would happen if this were possible. Is there something that could be done at a certain point with AI and digital printing? I don't know. There are no slow spots in this entire film. There is a certain kineticism to face off. It just keeps building and building and building. And there are little, like kind of mini, mini climaxes as the story goes. But you know that it's going to come down to some kind of face off between Travolta and Cage. And the question is, who's going to be who in the moment of truth? Is Sean Archer going to be John Travolta, his, his honest, his authentic self? Is Nicolas Cage going to be Caster Troy? And the movie deals with all of those things as well as it possibly can. And I give this four stars. There aren't that many pure action movies that I will absolutely say four stars. Die Hard is one. Face Off is one. Terminator 2 is another. Although there are some people that would... Because Terminator 2, I guess, is a little bit more sci-fi. The science fiction element is just the body switch element here in Face Off. If you haven't seen it, see it. You won't be disappointed. I don't know anybody who doesn't like this movie in the same manner of I don't know a single person who has seen Terminator 2 that says it sucks. And I don't know anybody, literally no one, who said, oh, the first Die Hard's a piece of shit. No. Impossible. If you, if you hate action movies, that's different. I don't like shit blowing up real good. I don't like blood and guts. I don't like people getting shot. Okay. Well, that's different. But if you're somebody, if you say, I love Die Hard, I love the whole Die Hard series, am I going to like Face Off? Yeah. Yeah. 100%. You will. Face Off. Directed by John Woo. Starring John Travolta, Nicolas Cage, Joan Allen. Oh, Dominique Swain. Harv Presnell, there's an actor. Boy, he was good. He plays Travolta Superior in the uh, Alphabet Soup. Released yesterday, 27 years ago, June 27, 1997. If you haven't seen it, see it. If you've seen it, see it again. This is a movie worth revisiting every couple of years. Just be dazzled all over again, and there'll be certain... Bits of plot that you've forgotten. Say, Jin, I don't even remember they did this. Son of a bitch, I thought that character died. Well, oops, as they say. But this has been episode number 228 of the Confessions of a Not-So-Dangerous Mind podcast. I'd like to thank you all for spending some of your Friday evening with me here in New York. If you check out this episode on the YouTube channel, haven't done so already, please click like, subscribe, comment, share, turn on those notifications. Or if you catch this episode on the audio platform such as Spotify or iTunes, same general rule applies. Click like, subscribe, share, and turn on those notifications. I'll be back with episode 229 real, real soon. Till then, peace.